Now I want to make something crystal clear here. The underpinning philosophy of the animal movement as it stands now, utilitarianism does not call for an end to animal use. Hey everyone, I hope you and your loved ones are doing okay during this challenging time and that you're finding ways to connect and support each other. To that end, you may like to check out a new Facebook page that Roger Yates and I started called The Animal Rights Show, where we do regular live videos such as Q&As and vegan pub quizzes. While I appreciate we can't always do the same things we would normally do, I think there are some new opportunities for us to evolve, and that's kind of the spirit behind this video. As for this video itself, I've been bursting to get some of these ideas out there, so let's get into it. I've been vegan for just over six years, and for the last three years I've spent most of my waking hours campaigning for other animals. During that time, I've had loads of conversations, both with myself and with others, and I've identified three core attacks on the animal movement. Now I'm not trying to use the word attack to suggest there's malicious intent. I think in most of these cases, it's not intentional. However, I do think they pose a specific threat, which is why I'm choosing to use the word attack. These three attacks are suggestions that we should drop the vegan label, the utilitarian philosophy as opposed to a rights-based view, and the third is a general indifference or in some cases complete lack of respect for human rights and the misanthropy that often comes with it. So my plan is to go through each of these three issues, summarize the key points for each of them, and then share my opinion. Now I think probably all three of these issues have been blamed for dividing the movement. I think some of us have probably seen some of those horrible comment threads on Facebook. However, I can't help but wonder if perhaps this division is coming from the way we're approaching these issues rather than the issues themselves. So in the spirit of that, at the end of this video, I'm going to invite anyone who would like to come and discuss these issues with me through respectful solution-based dialogue. At the end of those conversations, even if we don't agree, hopefully we can at least move towards understanding where the other person is coming from. Now on to the first topic, the suggestion that we should completely stop using the word vegan. And I'm not talking about using this word less, but avoiding the word altogether. Now I'm familiar with four key points that suggest we should drop the label vegan. The first is the negative associations with the word vegan and that people don't want to be associated with it. The second is that the meaning of the word has become diluted. This could refer to people thinking that veganism is only a diet, that we could be sending a reducitarian message, that due to the subjective interpretation, that there are multiple interpretations of what veganism actually means, and that it may lead towards more welfare-based conclusions, which we'll get into more in the next section. The third point is that the word vegan has a human-centric focus versus an animal-centric one. Specifically that we're talking about humans being vegan versus talking about the other animals who are used. The fourth key point that I've come across is that it lacks a focus on speciesism and rights. Now as far as for reasons for keeping the word, it's not just because I don't want to change the name of my group. I mean I literally changed my tagline to respect the rights of all animals last week. Now as far as labels go, no one has to identify with the word vegan. It's not as if people are going to go into a shop, try to buy some hummus, and they're going to say, we need to see your vegan identification or we can't sell this to you. And I need to see some ID. <laughs> of course. I appreciate social situations may be difficult to navigate, and I'm not trying to discount that. But in my experience, using the word vegan can actually help articulate my position. As for there being confusion about what the word means, isn't that up to us to address? As animal advocates, isn't a key role for us to help build awareness about these important issues? Now as for there being a stigma associated with the word, if someone gets upset just by hearing the word vegan, chances are they're probably not ready to have an open-minded conversation about veganism. So they're probably not the best people to be focusing our limited energy on to begin with. Plus, if we start moving on to new words, who's to say people don't know what that means either, and that one day we will have the same situation and have to keep jumping to the next word? Why start over from scratch? Now on the third point, I completely agree we should have an animal-centric focus, and I strive to do this throughout my advocacy. However, I don't think this should be conflated with the suggestion to drop the word vegan. In my experience, we can do both. For instance, we can say we're vegan because we choose not to support animal use, or a variation of that. To me, the word vegan is one of the most direct ways we can communicate how to live aligned with the philosophy of animal rights. I mean, if we're talking to somebody about animal use and they say, I agree with what you're saying, but how do I get started? What are we going to say to them? Plus, shouldn't we have a suitable alternative in place before we even begin to discuss dropping the word? What are we even comparing this to? 
Wouldn't dropping the word vegan without a suitable alternative in place be more likely to dilute our message, which is one of the concerns raised in the first place? Now as for bringing the conversation back to a focus on speciesism or animal rights, I think we can absolutely do that while still using the word vegan. Such as by saying, I respect the rights of others through veganism. While I'm completely on board with our language being dynamic, and I think this can be used to our advantage, I think if we start to abandon helpful words like this, it's going to start to hold back our message and our movement. Now if you don't want to use the word vegan, that's your prerogative. However, I think there's serious risks as outlined above for encouraging others to do the same. So to be clear, I don't think we should stop using the word vegan. Now the second, and probably the one of these that I feel the most passionate about, is the utilitarian philosophy as opposed to a rights-based view. Now to introduce how these two philosophies are different, first is a short clip from Peter Singer, who's probably best known for his book Animal Liberation, which was published in 1975. Um, philosophically, I'm not an animal rights advocate um, because I don't think that rights is the appropriate terminology to think about the issue. Um, I would think of it in terms of the, the question that you specifically asked me, in terms of equality, um, equality between humans and animals in a very specific sense because, again, it's obvious that humans and animals are not politically equal. We couldn't give them the right to vote. Um, but, but there's a sense in which uh, I think they do share an important equality, and that is the capacity to suffer or to enjoy their lives. And I think that ought to lead to a, a moral equality in the sense that I think their pain ought to count just as much as the pain of a human being, where it's a similar amount of pain. This next clip is from Tom Reagan, the originator of rights-based animal rights, who authored The Case for Animal Rights in 1983. Here are some of his thoughts on utilitarianism. Will the objection be finally that no one has rights, not any human being and not any other animal either, but rather that right and wrong are a matter of acting to reduce the best consequences, being certain to count everyone's interest and to count equal interests equally? This moral philosophy, utilitarianism, has a long and venerable history Influential men and women, past and present, are among its adherents, and yet it is a bankrupt moral philosophy if ever there was one. Are we seriously, seriously, to inquire into the interests of the rapist before declaring rape wrong? Should we ask the child molester whether his interests would be frustrated before condemning the molestation of our children? Remarkably, a consistent utilitarianism demands that we ask these questions, and in so demanding, relinquishes any claim on our rational ascent. Now, as you probably noticed, these two and their philosophies don't align. While these two philosophies may seem quite similar on the surface and probably both have the objective of leading more moral lives, these subtle differences actually produce dramatically different outcomes, especially when applied to the real world. A quick note, I tend to prefer to focus on the issues rather than the individuals. However, in this case, I thought it was necessary to make an exception. Okay, so let's start with utilitarianism. This philosophy is often associated with the Jeremy Bentham quote, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Singer's utilitarianism focuses on equality and specifically the equality of interests. One way to view this is that it's trying to achieve the best balance of everyone's satisfactions and frustrations. Now, some of the language that's often used for utilitarianism is talking about animal welfare, treatment, animal cruelty, animal abuse, or suffering. The basic idea here is to look at the severity of the suffering and the number of animals involved. A simple way to articulate this is that if a thousand beings experience the same level of suffering, that a hundred beings experiencing that same suffering would be better because there's less beings involved. Now the last and perhaps the key point around all this is that utilitarianism does not have the end goal of ending animal use. Now I appreciate those who campaign for this philosophy want to see a vegan world one day. However, that is not what the underpinning philosophy calls for. For example, if human interests outweigh the same like interests of other animals, the animals will still lose. Now, the other key philosophy when it comes to animal issues is a rights view. And this is framed by the originator of rights-based animal rights, Tom Reagan. Now, the rights view is clear and uncompromising and generally speaking, doesn't require any rough calculations. Now, the rights view focuses on the individual. And while interests are a part of the philosophy, it's not the core focus as it is with utilitarianism. 
The rights view recognizes that each individual has moral value regardless of their utility to others. So a basic definition could be that the philosophy of animal rights says that all animals are unique individuals with a life and story of their own, and like us, experience complex emotions. These experiences mean they have a valid claim to basic moral rights. It's important to note that the philosophy of animal rights focuses on moral rights that we all have from birth, not legal rights that need to be granted by some type of legislative process. Now, the language of animal rights would refer to things like animal use, completely unnecessary breeding or killing, and how other animals' rights are being ruthlessly violated. Some key things a rights view, or specifically Reagan, might say, you don't change unjust institutions just by tidying them up, cruelty compounds the wrong, but it is not the fundamental wrong, and that a good end does not justify evil means. Now the fourth, and perhaps most important part, is that the rights view calls to a complete end to animal use, not an improvement in the way that they're used. Now I align with a rights-based approach to animal advocacy because while I appreciate that the utilitarian philosophy has good underlying moral intent, it calls for us to ask immoral questions that quite frankly are unanswerable and not applicable to the real world more often than not. The rights view also focuses on objective language centered around ending use versus improving conditions through subjective language. I've also found the rights view to be more direct and that it doesn't require robust calculations that Peter Singer himself acknowledges are rough and don't need to be precise. I think this is due to the rights view's focus on the individual versus the utilitarian focus on aggregate suffering. I mean, who even makes these calculations? Are we supposed to make them in our day-to-day -day lives or expect some large body to make the calculations for us? Utilitarianism also frames most of its points around situations if we have to do something. We don't have to support animal use. It's completely unnecessary, and there's no biological requirement for us to eat or use them. As an example, to help articulate this distinction between the two philosophies, let's look at the 4,000 plus beagles that are tested on each year in the UK, or any species for that matter. Now, Singer has written that a case could be made that humans shouldn't be tested on because of the resultant terror in populations that other animals wouldn't be capable of. How are we to say that other animals that are used in labs aren't terrified either? Besides, without this reasoning, couldn't you say that their experiences are unfiltered because they couldn't explain them away? I mean, this could make things worse for them if we were going to try to make a calculation. Which begs the question, why try to make a calculation at all? Plus, Singer's calculations around suffering don't seem to account for the days not lived. And even if the animals who are already here aren't aware of those days that they miss out on by being needlessly killed, don't they still have a right to those experiences? Since when did we need to be aware of something to have a valid moral claim to it? I mean, I honestly don't know what I'm gonna be doing in five minutes from now, except for editing this video. That doesn't mean I don't have a valid moral claim to those experiences. That's why I think the rights view is stronger because it talks about the right to that future life. Utilitarianism also puts us in a situation which requires us to rank different kinds of suffering. Besides, shouldn't the victims be the ones to decide that? Plus, the important thing isn't how much they suffer, but that they suffer at all, or as the rights view might say, that their rights are violated. Now just a quick note, this isn't a matter of taking the best things from each philosophy or even believing in both of them. These two positions hold entirely different views, and utilitarianism is not compatible with rights, which Singer acknowledges himself. Now I want to make something crystal clear here. The underpinning philosophy of the animal movement as it stands now, utilitarianism, does not call for an end to animal use. Peter Singer himself has said, It's pretty difficult to be a conscientious omnivore and avoid all the ethical problems, but if you really were thoroughgoing and eating only animals that had had good lives, that could be a defensible, ethical position. Singer also said, to avoid inflicting suffering on animals, not to mention the environmental costs of intensive animal production. We need to cut down drastically on the animal products we consume. But does that mean a vegan world? That's one solution, but not necessarily the only one. If it is the infliction of suffering that we are concerned about, rather than killing, then I can also imagine a world in which people mostly eat plant foods, but occasionally treat themselves to the luxury of free-range eggs or possibly even meat from animals who live good lives under conditions natural for their species and are then humanely killed on the farm. 
This utilitarian philosophy has dramatic negative impacts on the world by calling for welfare reforms rather than ending use. It begs us to ask questions like, would welfare reforms pass anyway because they're more profitable? Even if these reforms did pass, what kind of improvements are we actually getting? Would the massive amount of investments in these campaigns not be better spent building awareness about ending all use? Is welfare reform the way to get us to stop using other animals? Or is it potentially a distraction? Now, the RSPCA in the UK was founded in 1824, nearly 200 years ago. I'd be curious what's happened since then that's brought us any closer to stopping the use of other animals. Another question is why do so-called abolitionist organizations continue to use welfare-based language such as animal cruelty, suffering, and animal abuse if their goal is to end all use? Why not replace these words by talking about animal use, the needless breeding or killing, or how other animals' rights are being violated? Does suggesting that we need to change the way other animals are used rather than ending their use altogether undermine the message that animal use is a matter of strict justice? To keep this video shorter, I'll share my thoughts around those questions for future discussions. So to wrap up my thoughts around these two competing philosophies, rather than taking the Jeremy Bentham approach and focusing on suffering, wouldn't a stronger question be to ask whether other animals have a right to be respected and not be needlessly bred or killed? So if anything that I've mentioned about the philosophy of utilitarianism gives you pause, I encourage you to look at the movement itself. Because the sad reality is, this is the underpinning philosophy of the movement as it stands today. Intentional or not. Now, if these last few minutes is any indication, this is part of a complex metaphilosophical discussion which I plan to explore more in future videos. Now, the third core attack on the animal movement that I'd like to cover is anti-intersectionality, which may also be referred to as animals first, animals only, or variations of those. Now, one of the key concerns that I've observed people say when they're resistant to the idea of intersectionality is that it may take the focus off other animals. I find this anti-intersectional approach is also often entangled with the idea of misanthropy or the hatred towards other humans. To be honest, I get it. I mean, I'm outraged by the pervasive violation of other animals' rights by humans. Especially when we consider that at a basic level, there's no explanation for why they're morally different to us than through arbitrary claims rooted in human superiority or speciesism. However, rather than how we feel, I'd like to focus on the best ways, both theoretically and practically, to advocate for the rights of other animals. I've also noticed that those who resist these ideas often focus on the individuals in their critique rather than the ideas themselves. To me, this would be a bit like someone saying, I'm not considering veganism because I met a vegan that I didn't like. Freeze! Vegan police! Vegan police! Todd Ingram, you're under arrest for veganity violation. Code number 827. Five and a half and a half. Okay, so now let's go through a few of the key reasons for adopting a pro-intersectional approach. First, you'll notice that I added pro in front of intersectional, and this is to give credit to Kimberly Crenshaw, who originally came up with the idea of intersectionality, which has then been applied to animal issues. So this is to help not take away from the origination of the word. However, if you don't like talking about intersectionality, it could be simply referred to as respecting human rights concerns. The first thing is we don't have to pick just one thing to oppose. When it comes to human rights and the rights of other animals, as Reagan says, It is not between either helping humans or helping other animals. One can do both. We should do both. Now as for some quick notes around misanthropy, how do we expect people to be open to implementing the changes we're suggesting if we come across as that we're hating them? Besides, behavioral psychology has taught us that the change agent or the one suggesting the change and their relationship with the person who may be doing said change is the most important factor of whether or not that change will actually be implemented. Plus, I think if we go around hating everyone, there's a pretty good chance that this will negatively impact our sustainability and limit our ability to campaign for other animals and their rights. As for the last point, shouldn't we be focusing on the issues rather than individuals we've encountered in the past that may relate to those issues? I think a key point to all this is to be indifferent or even resistant to human rights concerns is incompatible with the philosophy of animal rights. This can be quickly confirmed by looking at a few key quotes from the originator of rights-based animal rights, Tom Reagan. 
To ensure that we do not pave the way for such injustices as slavery or sexual discrimination, we must believe that all who have inherent value have it equally. And more specifically, his quote which says that the animal rights movement is part of, not opposed to, the human rights movement. Which begs the question, for people who are indifferent to human rights, are they genuinely part of the animal rights movement as framed by the originator of rights-based animal rights? And if not, what movement are they a part of? Now I like to think of our fundamental rights as our animal rights that we share with other animals. It's then those human rights that can be stacked on top of this. So we're not talking about the right for dogs to drive cars. Now to me it makes sense that the rights of other animals is related to human rights and vice versa. So why would we campaign for one and be indifferent towards the other? It doesn't make sense. Plus, why limit the potential for veganism? If we're talking to someone and they say something along the lines of, you know, you vegans only care about the animals, what are we gonna say to them? Even if you reject the th underpinning theory behind all of this, from a strategic perspective, it doesn't make sense. Now, this isn't to say that if you're on the street talking to someone about veganism, that someone's gonna run over, knock the flyers out of your hand, and insist you hand out a flyer around human rights. At a basic level, I think all we have to do is to acknowledge this positive potential for our relations with other animals to impact our relationship with humans as well. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean we need to start regularly campaigning for human rights. At a basic level, all we have to do is just not make their jobs any harder. Also, at a basic level, indifference towards human rights concerns, let's take sexual assault for example, is going to make people in the movement feel unsafe if we disregard this as a serious issue. So there you have it. Those are the three core attacks on the animal movement as I see them. I honestly don't have the words to convey how important I think these issues are to advancing the plight of other animals. Now I did my best to fairly characterize these positions. If you have any thoughts about what I've said in this video, please consider sharing your thoughts in the comments. I also want my opinion to be a catalyst for discussion. So if you or someone you know thinks differently to some of the opinions I've shared here in this video, please feel free to share this with them. Or if you may think these ideas are worth getting out there, you may like to share this in vegan groups. We could have a pre-recorded video chat or a live stream to get more people involved. I'm open to either. If you'd like to see me explore these ideas with others through video chats, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. And if you're vegan curious and you just want to have a chat about veganism or animal rights, I'm open to doing that too. The whole idea is to start a new wing of my advocacy where I'm doing a whole lot more video chats, which to me is I think a key way we can evolve our advocacy through this pandemic. Why not come join me for a chat? And maybe, just maybe, we can find a way through all of this together and create a better future for all animals. Thanks for watching, and for free resources such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.